A big congratulations today goes to Brian Morden and Alejandro Ruiz, two excellent, talented para planners that work with us because they passed their CFP exams this weekend. And in short order, they will have those three little letters next to their names. Congrats to those two. They busted their butts and they got it done. It was it's a six, great way. Six to nine months probably of studying. I mean, and, and a passing rate that's probably around, what, 60%? um yeah that sounds not wrong to me so congrats to them man they got it done I, over I, and out i need to ask you a question though it came up on saturday so i'll do a quick aside before we start okay i went to a house to watch the umfsu game oh yeah and our friends their daughter was sitting with us watching the game her boyfriend went to the game okay. so in the middle of the third quarter the mom looks at her daughter and says I hope your boyfriend's not still at the game. She pulls out her phone and she's got an app that I guess tells her where her boyfriend is. Oof, that's not going to work out. Is this something that people now have on all their phones? Like you and Schaefer track each other where you are on your phone? Oh, interesting. I was wondering where you were headed with this question because you could have gone fair weather fan or you could have gone that relationship's not going to last very long <laughs> because that relationship's not going to last very long. I am... Maybe Not it was for like track your phone purposes. I don't tracking. know. Tracking. Nah, I don't look. I think everyone has a right to some level of privacy. I don't think you need to uh, track your significant other's location. Spouses also track their spouse's spending habits. They know what they spend on the credit cards. Do you have that in play? Well, well, yeah, because we use the same credit card, but I don't. But does it give you alerts? No, that would be annoying. I'd get so many alerts. Yeah, I, I know some people that get alerts from when their spouses spend. That seems a little over the top. I agree, but counterpoint, you wouldn't be married to a spendthrift. I don't know. Love comes in odd shapes and forms. Um, good job, Brett Horowitz. Better job, Victoria Horowitz. <laughs> <laughs> what? I just have to record videos with you, dude. Same house? Oh, man. It should be vice versa. Good, better job, Brett Horowitz, of finding Victoria. She, I won the lottery. She just got, she got an okay average talker chart guy. I won the lottery. Though. Oh, and yeah, okay, yeah. So who's luckier? Yes, Brett Horowitz is luckier. For sure. Welcome to Talk Your Chart with Marco Seguera and Brett Horowitz. Brett, it's wonderful to see you today. You just mentioned this is episode 25. Oh, you know what I want to start doing now because we never do it is I want to timestamp it. We are recording on November 8th of 2022, just in case stuff happens between now and the airing of this episode. Episode 25, which means, yes, Brett, we are halfway to episode 50, which is the coffee episode. Um, you asked if you get to put a bunch of stuff in your coffee or not. I don't know. We'll figure it out. I, I want to make you drink just, I think we got to go, there might be three coffees that you drink. It'll be Cuban coffee as is, Cuban coffee, no sugar, and then whatever Starbucks $12 delight you, you want to order. You should but want me digress. You should want me to like the coffee, not, not have a horrible experience. No, I, I, so I, and that's, that's the only reason why I would say get diabetes from, from the coffee and go sh to Sugar Town. Um, but we'll figure it out. We got 25 episodes to fine tune this thing. Um, Brett, I am kicking off the morning with consumer finances, because I think this is, this just speaks to the underlying issue that the Federal Reserve is having, right? Which right. is on a relative basis, historically, not a big number. What's that mean? More money to spend. Let's look, draw your eyes right below that. Excess personal savings during the pandemic. Cumul cumulative excess savings of $2 trillion that consumers are now drawn down by a trillion. What's that mean? We're still sitting on a ton of cash. So we're still paying for all the things that are now costing more as corporations are kind of rah, rah, rah about their, their record setting profit margins. We're saying, hey, you know what? We can do it. We can borrow a little more and we can spend more because we got all this cash that hasn't been depleted yet. Well, I think it, it depends on, you know, it's a good chart because it shows that while things are not so bad, they are getting slightly worse right, which is to be expected. Um, and I think it also depends on the category of, an, of a consumer out there, whether you're the ultra rich, the rich, the middle class, the, low, the lower income class, uh, because obviously we read all the time, credit card debt's going up, 
people who don't have the savings, you know, are starting to now put that on their card because they don't have the money. Whereas the, the wealthy, you know, still have a lot of that income because they haven't spent it during the pandemic for travel and other discretionary expenses. Yeah, I, we just need to see it go more. Like the credit card balances are going up. Sure, by the way, they always do. Aggregate debt is always going up. But as a percentage of the stuff you can spend, it's just not at a stress point yet. So what's the Fed to do? Because this needs to stop. We need to stop spending in order for the Fed to get what they want. Because ultimately, if we have the financial capacity to pay up, we're going to do it. So what, what if we all made an effort to spend a little bit less as, as people? That maybe we could do that instead of having the Fed crash the economy. Well, it's happening on its own. So the chart that I've got here shows the quartiles between the top quartile or the, all the way down the bottom quartile. Okay. And you're seeing the top quartile come down quite a bit. Um, and you're seeing uh, that it's happening on its own in the last handful of years. And then bottom right is what you talked about, sort of where the household debt is as a percentage of income compared to what it was in the recession, where it was 12, 13%. Um, and so, yeah, quite a bit lower than that. And it's, but it's, it's increasing, which it needs to happen because like you said, the Fed wants that to happen. It's ultimately good for bringing inflation down. Yeah. And so let's play, this plays right into the job chart I have because let's, let's look at this, but let's also talk about something that's not on this chart for jobs, which is labor participation. It just ticked down again to 62.2%. Why aren't people looking for jobs? Because of what we just talked about, maybe? I don't know. But anecdotally, we hear it all the time. People are trying to hire, having trouble hiring. They're looking to hire because they have excess demand. So until we get aggregate demand to come down, the Fed's not going to stop. And this is going to continue. So this chart, what's it showing us? That, yes, we had a high. The orange line is job openings. We're off the highs right, of almost 12 million openings. It was trending nicely, which is so funny to say trending nicely. This is the whole bad news is good news thing. But we just had a little surprise and job openings are up again, double the people looking for jobs. So we need more people to look for jobs. That 3.7% unemployment, yeah, that shows strength in the economy, but that needs to go up apparently before the Fed stops doing their thing. Right. But Marcos, you don't see any, even though you see a trend, you don't see straight lines. You see lots of jagged lines. Right. So just because and the Fed doesn't look at one number and says, oh, my gosh, the last month we had more people, you know, looking for jobs. And so that's a bad thing. They look at the trend. So the trend is still down. We hope the trend continues to come down. Uh, but you're right. The, the jobs, the fact that everybody has a job, unless you don't want a job because you're COVID, because of not finding daycare for whatever reason, um, you know, that's going to keep wage inflation high. And that's a big problem. Look, you're right. And yes, no, I'm not trying to oversell any one statistic here because they have all these metrics that we would assume if we're looking at them, they're probably looking at them also. I think the most important thing to come out of the last Fed meeting was the idea of the Powell pause, right? When they're going to kind of hit the brakes on rising interest rates. They now said they understand and appreciate that what they're doing in the form of monetary policy is a lagging thing. They do all this stuff. And then eventually you see impacts in global economy, U.S. economy, and aggregate demand. So if they're truly going to pay attention to that, that means they have to stop to then let some level of the death settle to be able to see what they've done so far. Well, the, the parts that they've hit the most, which is the most obvious, is going to be housing. So we're going to talk oh, about that here. Housing. Because that's, that's where they have direct control over, right? Every time they raise rates, that goes right to mortgages, that goes right to home equity lines, goes right to credit card debt. So the first chart we have here is the inventory of single family homes. And you can see how many homes um, are now for sale as a trend going back over the last, what, 40 years. And yeah. it's as low as it's lower than it's ever been in, in the past. As you made a point last time, anybody who's got a low interest rates, like us two here on this call, are probably not moving anytime soon, given those low interest rates. You're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. And this, so play off that let's look at the housing affordability index it's not a surprise it's terrible why because rates just jumped by over 100 percent if we're talking about the 30-year mortgage and you have home prices that are sky high so what does that combine to become no housing affordability so if you're looking for a home you're, you're not 
you're not making a move now and you're not leaving a sub 3% mortgage to be able to go pay double that in, in a new mortgage payment. So what, what's the hope? Thankfully, we're not, I think it's Australia, Europe, and UK have a super duper high percentage of their outstanding mortgages that are adjustable rate mortgages. We're not like how we were in the great financial crisis. We're not going to suffer that. I think the UK is up to 40% of all mortgages or arms, adjustable rate mortgages, that's going to be rough. And talk about demand destruction. That's when you see that debt service ratio jump from 9% to 15 because you suddenly go from paying a $2,000 mortgage to a $3,500 mortgage, right? Forget about going to Home Depot. Yeah, I mean, this is a chart that I've got pulled up here with the Home Affordability Index, or I'm sorry, Refinanceability Index, which is, you know, how many people really would be left to refinance who haven't over the last 10 years? I mean, reading a ton of articles about the rocket mortgages and all these mortgage companies that just cleaned up over the last 15 years because every month more and more people were refinancing. And now their only hope is to say, hey, refinance to a much higher rate, but at least cash out some of the equity you have. Because without that, who's going to want to go from a 3% uh, mortgage to a 7% mortgage? Our biggest I'm, uh, I'm pivoting entirely right because i thought this chart was hilarious this came from a from a podcast that i that i that i frequent and we're talking meta the the artist formerly known as as facebook right um meta and its reality labs is obviously banking on this virtual reality thing taking over you and i have had a lot of fun talking about buying real estate in the metaverse and all this stuff in the metaverse and Again, not living in the, in the real world. Again, it's funny. We're not living in the real world as you and I are doing this over Zoom. Ha ha ha. Um, but this is framing the capital expenditure that Meta is planning in order to build out this whole metaverse thing that they're talking about. And it's comparing it to other life-altering innovations. It starts with the iPhone, 3.6 billion, the atomic bomb at 23. And obviously you can just kind of see here, it's they're basically spending Apollo program moon landing money, right? To be able to launch this metaverse. SpaceX is on here. That guy's going to put a rocket with people on Mars. And well, I bet you he's going to spend less than Meta is on reality labs. Anyway, also, this is not poo-pooing. Who knows though? He's also building tunnels below cities. Like the idea is that the, the two people have, you know, Zuckerberg and, and Musk is just incredible. And they're going all for it. And I don't know if this thing's going to work spending a ton of money to try but as a result the stock prices are getting hammered and so yeah. the chart that i want to show here is you know how badly it's been for technology companies and i think it's part of it was because we thought that technology companies would only go up and up and up because they did so well early in the pandemic right that's what everybody was using tech all the time and they're just their valuations got to be insane and so you see here that the s p information tech sector s and communication sector, everything involving the internet is just getting hammered this year, far worse than just showing the S&P 500. Yeah. And then, so the chart I just pulled up now, which is the index concentration, it speaks to your point. However, we're still looking at a tech sector that represents just shy of 30% of the S&P 500. So while yes, that's come down and the earnings contribution, which on the bottom right of this chart has come down, it's still, again, it's still the US economy. The other thing I tell you is the tech thing, it's just a math equation because rates have come up. The risk-free rate right. is now four or 5%. So forget about the publicly traded companies because think about this. If you like the private companies down 80%, they were raising money at like a hundred times ARR, annual recurring revenue. That's gone. Everyone's sharpened their pencils. And now if you're not profitable, you're not getting funded. And if you're going to get funded, you're going to do it and what, like, what they would call a down round, meaning the last time you raise money, that's not the valuation you're getting this time, my friend. You're going to absolutely take it on the chin this time around. So the tech sector is going through a culling, which I think is healthy. Um, and it's also made all those people that think investing is easy, right, come back to earth. We predicted this several times. We should go back to our old chart. So we said this is almost certain to happen, that value would come back, that growth would underperform. And because you have so much of tech's earnings in the futures. That's why inflation hurts it so much more than, than value. Yeah. Uh, just held up relatively And it's well. why am I going to go after some risky company that might get me 16%? I can just go buy a treasury for a little while instead. 
it's just tough. The hurdle rate, the hurdle rates are tough. So last chart I just want to share. I'm hoping this is really true uh, because someone sent it to me and I thought it maybe has some optimism associated with it. It's several different recessions that have occurred and basically yep. showing that when ISM, the Institute of Supply Management, which is manufacturing, um, when that hits its bottom, um, you basically are in and around the time where the markets have hit their bottom. And so I know ISM has been hovering around barely above 50, 50 above 50, you're expanding, below 50, you're contracting. So I'm really hoping that that means that we're sort of in seventh or eighth inning, maybe the ninth inning of this thing, and that we're near the bottom and all good signs going forward. I could take this side. If I take the opposite side, meaning I'll be a pessimist. We just got a technical recession in the first two quarters. We took a pause with Q3, just shy of 3% real growth. And now we could very easily get a negative Q4, negative Q1 of 23, and just double dip recession. Like it ain't nobody's business. But here's where I agree with you. Markets are forward looking. So they're yeah. discounting this stuff already. So right. we're we could very well be finding a bottom and consolidating to it, especially because who else, like if we're looking at the S&P, what has to fall in order for us to get down to an average bear market of 36%? We've only hit 25% down. We need the big companies to take it on the chin, the ones that represent the big parts of the index. And they were supposed to do that last earnings when they were reported a couple of weeks ago. Didn't happen. So well, what they have, what, but a lot are down a lot. Oh, no, no, but Brett, yeah, but like Peloton down, like 80% down? No, down. no, not that much. But we, we talked about how they were leading the gains going forward and that they're probably going to lead the losses, you know, when things turn around. I, yeah, I don't, what is it going to, what's it going to come from? How, what, what, what domino is going to fall where Amazon, Apple, especially Apple, Microsoft are certainly going to drop another 15, 20%? Because that's the thing that has to happen for the index to get down to 36 so it could have happened, sure. Get down to 36. Average bear market, homie. Average bear market. It could. It could happen. But no, yeah, I, don't, I don't see it. If but my left it's probably going to happen. If my left hands and fire my right hands in ice, on average, I'm warm. To warm. Cheers to Steve Foldless. <laughs> Averages. Come on. <laughs> I know. They're misleading. All right. Brett, good run. Good run. See you soon. Have a good one, Marcos.